welcome at um, this church and at the Rosebank Union uh, Church where we have the Rosebank Bible College course uh, that we're offering. Um, it's my privilege to welcome all of you here uh, tonight for this first lecture of the first module. I'll explain a bit more about the module as we go along, but I really do want to thank you for coming and for uh, choosing Rosebank Bible College as an option to learn more about the Bible. I think um, before we go anywhere, I would like to share with you just a few thoughts from the scriptures which really include the, my prayer for you and my prayer for myself. And it comes from uh, Psalm 119, uh, which is actually about the Word of God. In fact, several words that, you, that are used in Psalm 119 indicate very strongly that this is about God's Word. The words such as your law, your statutes, your precepts, your word, your promises, all of those words occur in the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. And so just a few extracts from this psalm. Verse 18 says, and um, I need to just find it quickly. It says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. This is my prayer for you. This is my prayer for myself. Uh, I have been through the Bible several times in my lifespan. I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, I was very fortunate that my parents introduced me to the Bible. And both in Sunday school and church, I've learned much about the Bible. But the Bible has depths that I have personally not explored. And so my prayer for myself and my prayer for you, especially through this course, is that the Lord would open our eyes so that we, we would see more uh, of Him in His Word. A verse that is well known, Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And I honestly believe that that is true. The more we live in the word, the more we allow God's word to guide us and to lead us, the more we will have light, God's light, uh, shine upon the path that we need to go in the future. Another verse, uh, verse 130. And it says... Your, uh, Psalm 119 verse 129 says, Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I regard myself as a fairly simple person, sometimes even stupid, but uh, certainly simple in my mind and in my approach to life and everything else. And I'm praying that, that God would give me wisdom and insight. Uh, so that I would know Him better, so that I would be able to make wiser choices uh, in life. And then the last verse that I want to highlight is 133. And it says, Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Um, from a New Testament perspective, as well as in the Old Testament, we have the directive that we should live holy lives, that we should avoid sin in our lives. And there is no better way of avoiding sin but to live in the Word of God. The more you know the truth, the more you know the holiness of God, the more it will guide us in living a lifestyle or a life that is pleasing uh, to God. And so my prayer is as we explore the Bible, and in this first module that's exactly what we're going to do. We're just going to explore the background, the setting, uh, of the Bible, the context of the Bible, the reliability of the Bible, um, that, that it would give you more and more confidence, but also ultimately that you would spend more time in the Bible, in the Word of God. Ultimately, that is our goal. And um, I pray that through this particular course and through the discipline of, of, of coming on a weekly basis, that you would be able to do that uh, more effectively. I want to pray as, um, as we start uh, on this journey together. And so let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would help us as we get to know you through your word, that you would lead us and guide us. I pray for clarity of mind. I pray that you would help me uh, in my speaking to bring glory to your name. I pray that in our listening and in our learning that we will get to know you better and more intimately so that we can live for you to glorify your name and bring praises to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, welcome to Rosebank Bible College, and thank you for choosing to complete a module with uh, RBC. 
uh, and in future I probably just refer to RBC rather than Rosebank Bible College. Um, the modules are focused on giving you a good grounding and a knowledge of the Bible. I actually, one of my goals in this course is to give you more confidence in the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. And um, we're going to go into the background. We're going to look at the message of the Bible over time. And each of the modules that we offer, this is the first one of four foundational modules, uh, uh, is offered over an eight-week period. So this is lecture one. There will be eight lectures, uh, another seven to come after this one, and then um, 16 hours of lecture time together. There's a little bit of a tea break in the middle, as you will see, and also experience uh, a bit later on. I don't, uh, don't just want to talk for two hours on end. But um, every day or every time we come together, what we will do is, is deal with a relevant biblical or Bible topic, and I will introduce those to you and also encourage you to read some more on that particular topic. And then uh, we will start with a short devotion, something similar to what I've done. Um, this is not a preaching class. This is, um, this is not a, a preaching session. I'm not going to preach, although every now and again I get into preaching mode. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about myself in just a moment. Uh, but the lecture time is for two hours with a tea break of about 10 minutes. Effectively, it boils down to 15 minutes by the time everybody is back probably about 15 minutes. So that's essentially how we're going to divide the lecture time. And my commitment to you is that uh, we start on the dot um, normally, uh, give and take one or two minutes, maybe a minute or so late, but uh, we, we will never go over time uh, after the lecture. So that's a commitment, especially uh, the evening lecture. Um, I'm really committed to get you out here and, and at home as soon as possible. As many of you know by now, my name is Gerard Trenter. Uh, I grew up in a pastor's home and uh, at a very early age made a commitment uh, for Jesus Christ and he became my Savior and Lord and I was very privileged that my parents raised me in that environment. Um, after school I went and studied for four years at a Baptist college. I then went to university. It was then Rao, it's now UJ and I studied some more. Uh, apart from the fact that I also went to the army and all sorts of things, I then passed at several churches. In the meantime, I also had a, um, an overseas trip and studied for a master's degree and uh, came back and, and registered again for a doctorate at uh, Rao at the time in biblical studies and um, completed my, my doctoral studies in the 80s already, so that dates me roughly. Um, and I completed that in the area of New Testament. Uh, but it gave me a love for the Bible. Uh, and the other major love that I have is that of the church, the local church. So initially I thought the Lord was going to lead me into an academic career, uh, but I ended up loving the church so much that I just wanted to pastor churches. But after several years and after about three different church ministries, uh, I was called to become the principal of the Cape Town Baptist Seminary, um, and I was there for 13 years, and about four years ago I accepted a call to come and head up Rosebank Bible College, and this is a combination. I'm also one of the pastors at the Rosebank Union Church. So in a certain sense, my two loves, the one for the Bible and teaching, and the other one for church and my local church involvement came together uh, in this position. So that gives you a little bit of a background about me. Uh, I wish I can get to know every one of you uh, personally, uh, and over tea perhaps we will. Uh, and if you have any questions, um, I would encourage you to contact me by email, telephone, or in a personal conversation. Uh, and, and, and this I want to say up front, I just don't know everything. Uh, I wish I had. Sometimes I will, um, I will even fake it and maybe show that I actually know uh, maybe a lot, but I actually don't know that much. Uh, but if, if I don't know, and you have a question that I don't know the answer to, I will be very quick to say to you, I don't know the answer. I'll try and find out, and we can chat about that again. And no one person can know all the answers. Um, so I, I hope you will appreciate that fact as well. So why enroll at a Bible college like this? Uh, Roseman Bible College was started in 1973. Uh, initially, it, it developed very quickly into a three-year uh, certificate, diploma, and degree-granting institution. But when Rosebank Union Church was sold in Rosebank and moved to uh, Hurlingham here in Santon, uh, the college uh, came to a standstill at that particular time, the full-time residential program. And um, there were a bit of a, um, um, a sort of a, a trying to find our feet sort of thing. That's before my time. 
Um, but uh, ultimately, we believe the Lord has led us to affirm one of the biggest um, commitments of the college, and that is to help the person in the pew, the, the normal Christian, if you wish, to help people like you and I to know the Bible and to know the Bible background and the contents. So that's our goal, that's our mission, and that's our vision, uh, is to do exactly that. And so at Rosebank Bible College, a little help doesn't hurt. And uh, if you're on your own, I can, I can point you to all the books, websites, uh, probably other DVD and, and audio materials that you can listen to. Problem is discipline. The problem is when I do it on my own and I haven't enrolled for something specifically, it's very difficult to maintain the discipline. It's like a New Year's resolution. By the 2nd of January, most of those are gone. But it also provides a structured way of looking at the Bible and its content and context. Uh, and I will be sharing some information with you as we go along. Uh, we follow a disciplined approach uh, in, in the sense that you are forced to study. Uh, you will receive every week, you will receive an exact copy of the notes that you also see on the screen. Um, this is a set of notes. It comes with the course itself. And so um, you, can, you can go and read it all by yourself. I will obviously explain more, uh, illustrate more, sometimes deviate some. Uh, that happens for, fa fairly naturally for me. Um, but essentially, um, I'm going through the notes. So the screen the, the, is there to assist you a little bit uh, so that you don't have to look at my face all the time. Um, it's just my hairstyle may put people off uh, on, on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, and then uh, Rosemary Bible College has a total commitment to the bias, the Word of God. And um, I want to state that up front, uh, that is our approach. Uh, we, we take the Bible as the Word of God, and uh, we, we, we proclaim that as the Word of God, and I want to help you to understand what the Word of God is about. Rosemary Bible College has the desire to enhance your relationship with Christ by getting you into His Word. How do we get to know God? Well, we get to know Him through His self-revelation. How did God reveal Himself? Through the Bible. And so it's logic. It's a, it's a fairly logical argument. You want to know God, you get into the Bible, you, you read what God has said about Himself or what God, God has revealed uh, about Himself. There are many, many questions about the Bible. There are many issues that we can never and will never resolve. There are many mysteries in the Bible. There are many difficult passages in the Bible. But essentially, the Bible is God's Word revealed to us so that we can ultimately get to know God. And so that's our purpose. And I trust that we will not only get to know the Bible, which is what we are doing in this course, but as a result of this, that, that we will get to know God better. In terms of the foundational modules, I told you already, this is module number one called an introduction to the Bible. The other three following on, to, on this one, each one eight weeks long, um, is a survey of the Old Testament. And uh, we, we do that in the second quarter of the year. And we literally go through every single book of the Old Testament. Uh, I, I speak and I talk like a machine gun when we do that because to try and cover the background and the material and the context and the contents and the message of every one of the Old Testament books takes some doing, but it's worth the ride. And so it's one of those where you just need to hold on to your seat and, and uh, we'll eventually get there. We do the exact same thing with the New Testament in the third module. And um, we can slow down slightly because there are fewer books in the New Testament, but such wealth of information. Uh, that it's difficult to cover in eight weeks, but we actually do do that. And then in the fourth module, we take one step back and we say, okay, we, know now, we now know something about the background of the Bible, the context, uh, the history of Israel, and the New Testament, and the church, etc., etc. We've been through the whole of the Old Testament. We've been through book by book the New Testament. But how, how does it all hold together? And that's what we do in that final module, and we call it the big picture taking a step back and saying, okay, we've painted smaller pictures over the time, but how do they all fit together uh, in the big picture of the Bible? And we go through uh, about eight doctrines that we find in the Bible. There are many others, but eight of the major teachings or doctrines uh, of the Bible. And so that's in module number four. Each module is uh, independent of the other. There is a logical sequence, of course, uh, but you can register for this one and not come back for any of the others, or you can invite a friend to come to number two or number three or any one of those. Uh, they're all independent. There are no prerequisites uh, for any of these. So welcome to module one. This is an introduction with the emphasis on introduction. 
there is not a chance that we can cover the material that, that I'm going to cover in this course, in this module, uh, in depth. In fact, every single one of the topics that we deal with, starting tonight, uh, has been published in series of books. And when you go to, um, through theological studies, then you will study each of these as a semester-long course, uh, virtually. Um, and so I'm only interested in introducing you and then to stimulate your, uh, your curiosity so that you can go and do some more reading. And if you're interested, I hope that you will actually go and study further and learn some more. My main aim is to introduce you to the background and the significance of the Bible. And if I have succeeded at the end of this eight-week slot in doing that, then I feel like I've made some contribution. It also lays a foundation for the other modules, but as I said earlier on, uh, those, this one is not a prerequisite if you want to invite someone else uh, to any one of the other modules that follow. A few of the practical arrangements, uh, please make sure that you registered ultimately. We'll give you a couple of weeks to uh, register or deregister or re-register or do whatever. There are two different levels. The first is you sit here, you listen, you audit. You only listen, you don't do anything else. I would encourage you to, to do some extra reading anyway, uh, but we call that a certificate of attendance. And then there is also uh, a certificate of completion. And that is for those of you who want to do a bit of extra work and um, uh, you desperately need to read through the course outline. Make sure that you read it uh, and make sure that you understand what we are going to do and what is expected of you. You will be expected to do some additional reading and, and report on your reading um, very, in a very simple uh, way. You will uh, submit an assignment uh, on a particular topic. You can also choose the topic if you wish. And then you will write an exam at the end. And don't script for the exam. There's nothing, there's nothing, nothing major difficult about the exam. It's a test of your knowledge that you picked up over time. And uh, the week before the exam, I will actually give you an, ha an handout which will prepare you for the exam that will come uh, a week later. Get a copy of the guidelines to write an assignment. And many people ask me, how, how do I complete the assignment? What, what are your expectations? Well, I prepared a document that will tell you from a, a research assignment what is expected and also the reading assignment, what is expected. So those copies are available. Please make sure that you get one. And then make sure you pay your fees. We're not going to haunt you and hunt you and, and do anything. Um, this is a Christian environment, although uh, sometimes Christians disappoint you. Um, but um, I, just, I just want to encourage you to make sure that you have paid your fees. And then at the end of the year, there is a graduation or a celebration. Uh, it's around a meal. It's informal, um, but you will receive a certificate. If you want to come to that event, you are more than welcome, and there will be more information towards the end of the year. It's the only time that we actually issue uh, certificates for the work completed during that one uh, year. So that leads us to the start of module number one, uh, which is lecture number one, the contents and the reliability of the Bible. In this uh, module, uh, you have it in the course outline as well. We're going to talk tonight about the contents of the Bible and the reliability of the Bible. Uh, a little bit more about the background, but then next week we'll talk about the canon of the Bible. More about that next week, uh, but it does not have anything to do with uh, canons and uh, war or anything like that. Uh, but I'll introduce that to you next week. And then we'll look at the history and the background of, uh, of Israel, um, and we'll go right to the history of Israel, and I'll, uh, on the whiteboard, I will give you an outline, a, a, a timeline rather, where we just look at the history of Israel as it unfolds. And uh, here is one of the first tips for the exam. Some of those dates, some of the major dates, will be in the exam. If you've been a student, you will be writing that down like crazy now, because I've just given you one of the questions in the exam. And then we look at the intertestamental period, uh, which is the, the period of roughly 400 years that, that is not described in our Bible. Uh, the Bible, as you know, uh, the last of the historical books is uh, the book of Nehemiah, and, and that's where the history of Israel ends in terms of the Bible description. Uh, the last book in the Bible is, uh, in the Old Testament is Malachi, and Malachi probably represents the last of the prophets. Uh, perhaps there may be one or two others, but Malachi probably the last. But then that's roughly 400 years before Christ. So we, in that one lecture, we talk about 
that period between the two New Testament. Where do we get our information and what actually happened during those 400 years before Jesus uh, was born? We're, we're then going to look at how the Bible was transmitted throughout a 2,000 year period and longer if you add the Old Testament era in there as well. And we're going to look at why do we say that this, this physical book that I have here, I can actually trust the actual words in this, that, that, that they are reliable. How, how, do, how do we know that? Uh, who has put this all together? And so that's what we look at in that lecture. And then in lecture number six, we'll look at translation, different translations, different methodologies and philosophies of translation. And um, I'll introduce you to some of the English translations, which is what uh, we are doing in this particular course. And then we also look at some of the Bible study tools and, and how to study your Bible. And in the, in the second last lecture, we look at the inspiration of Scripture. Once again, this is a book, and I've got plenty of other books here on this uh, table in front of me. But why do we say this one is inspired by God? What is the reasoning behind that and the theories around the inspiration of Scripture? And, and how do I know that I can trust it? So that's lecture number seven. And the last one, we look at some of the principles of interpreting the Bible, interpreting Scriptures, um, knowing the guidelines that we follow uh, in terms of interpreting the message of the Bible. Uh, there are many, many different views, uh, many uh, theologies, many churches, many movements around the world, all of them somehow claim that they have based whatever they believe on the Bible. And so in that particular lecture, we'll look at some of the guidelines to help us stay within the boundaries of Scripture as much as possible. Now, some of the resources that I am using, um, those are maybe, uh, they may be difficult to, to actually come by or to get hold of. Uh, I call them prescribed uh, works, but uh, I, I have to change the word to recommended because the books are sometimes not easily, um, uh, easily, to, uh, easily available. Uh, the first one is the IVB Introduction to the Bible, this one uh, by Philip or edited by Philip Johnston. And it, it does exactly what I'm doing in this course, especially in the second and the third module. So this book is valid for three of the modules that we are doing. And it goes book by book uh, through the whole of the Bible, following a particular pattern. Uh, and it is worth, well worth buying or getting hold of or borrowing. Um, I think the bookshop may have a few of those available. The other one really goes back all the way to the old days of Rosemary Bible College. There used to be uh, three different booklets used by Rosemary Bible College. Someone has taken those three booklets, put them in one book, and added a whole section to that book. And it's called Exploring the Bible by Harris, Schultz, Smith, and Dunnett. Um, and, and again, this is available. Sometimes Kum uh, has some of these, or our bookshop may have some of them available. A couple of other books that I want to show you. One is the Holman Bap uh, Bible Atlas. Uh, when you hear the word atlas, probably some Nachmeri uh, comes to mind from school in geography or something. Now, there is a geography lesson in this book, but it actually is a wonderful, colorful a uh, book where it, it gives you pictures of not only maps but background and it tells the story of the Bible uh, from literally from the beginning all the way through to the end uh, of the first century uh, AD. Um, I'll leave these on the, on the table so that you can have a look at it later on. I can't tell you the price of this one. Um, more recently, Kum had on sale uh, David Pawson's book and I think we picked it up for just over 100 Rand. Uh, David Pawson wrote Unlocking the Bible. Again, it's an overview of the Bible similar to what we are doing in this course. Uh, the difficulty, as I said to you, if you buy this book, you may not be as disciplined as you should be, and therefore you may not read all of this. But uh, if you do it on a week-to-week -week basis, um, e eventually that will be true of modules 2 and 3 especially. Um, another one that is very similar to the Holman Bible Atlas. Oh, this is heavy. Uh, it's called Biblica, the Bible Atlas. Um, and we actually have this one available. Uh, not exactly sure how it all happened, but a member of our church came and said um, a family member has access to the actual printers or the publishers of this book. And um, you won't believe it, but this goes for 350 rand. And we, we have some of these available. They're on a cash basis. They're not sold through our bookshop. Uh, if you go to some of the bookshops, you will pay 600 rand for that book. Um, and that I, I guarantee you that's the price of, of the book. Another very highly recommended um, 
resource that I want to show to you now is the, uh, the English Standard Ver Version, the ESV Study Bible. Uh, this is going to become a standard reference in the future. It has the text of the Bible. This one is, is bound. It comes from the bookshop itself. Um, and it it's also sells for 350 Rand. It has the Bible text in it. It has commentary at the bottom. It has introductory uh, uh, chapters. It has a concordance and more background information uh, in the back of this, this Bible. This particular one is 350. There are a few left of the 250 uh, version. They slightly differently bound, but the exact same information inside. So um, have a look at the ESV study Bible. So those are some of the resources that I highly want to recommend to you. And there, there's certainly other books and sources of a similar or even a better um, brand. You're more than welcome to have a look at it. Let me make a comment about the internet because that's the other thing that I want to encourage you to do is to get to, get to know the internet and what the internet can do for you uh, and also what the internet cannot do for you. The internet cannot provide you a truth all the time. In fact, you don't always know what the internet is giving because anybody and everybody can publish a blog or a section or a, or a page or design a site or whatever. And you just don't know where the, the source is and whether it is a reliable source. So I want, to, I want to encourage you to be very careful, however, to make use of the Internet. Some of the resources that, that you find on the Internet are like uh, BibleGateway.com, excellent resource to go. You have to be online, but you can, you can search pages and Bibles and verses and concordances and all sorts of different things. And there are loads and loads of those kinds, and more and more are being published over time. Just be very careful. The other option is to actually have a program or buy a program or to download a program that you can install on your PC, which you don't necessarily have to do online. Uh, something like eSword is a free download, and it, it includes Bibles of, of a, uh, I don't know how many different translations. You can pick and choose them. Um, and then on, on my uh, laptop, I have PC Study Bible, which is a great quick resource. I can go and search for a book or a, a verse or a, a topic or anything like that. Um, so those are uh, Bible software programs. And then... Um, I've already referred to um, the Holman Bible Atlas, so I'll skip that one. Tonight, um, I want to introduce you to the Bible, the Word, Bible, the, uh, our beliefs about the Bible, a little bit about the history and the Bible. We'll talk more about that in the future, in the near future. We'll talk about the reliability of the Bible. Um, there are certain objective facts that I want to share with you tonight about the Bible. And there's certain things that we subjectively believe. Objective means I can prove it to you. Um, these are objective facts. Subjective means these are things that I believe. Now, you may say, well, I don't believe what you believe, which is fine. Um, it's like an atheist who says, well, I don't believe in the Bible. And, and, and I would have to say to him, well, there's certain objective facts that I can share with you. Uh, he, he may not necessarily think they're important, but he can't argue with the objective facts. The subject of uh, truths or beliefs, he can argue with because it's my belief as opposed to his or her belief. And, and that's the way it goes with subjective beliefs. And then we'll look very briefly at the contents of the Bible just to get a bit of an overview of what we find uh, in the Bible. So that's where we're heading. Um, every, in every lecture, I will refer to the two major textbooks that I'm using as well as another resource which is called a New Bible Dictionary, it's called. And um, in the New Bible Dictionary, it's exactly what it says. It's a dictionary, and you can look up words. If you look up the word covenant or Bible, uh, Abraham, uh, a name, a place, and, and anything like that, you will find that in a Bible Dictionary. The New Bible Dictionary is a great resource to have. Uh, it's not new, but it's very, very rel reliable. Uh, but in the other two books, in the IVP, uh, introduction to the Bible as well as exploring the Bible, I will refer to the page numbers in, in the books and the, also in the copies that I have. Uh, subsequent um, editions of these books may have different page numbers, but it would be very easy to find them. By way of introduction and overview, what is this book that we call the Bible? The word, the name, the word Bible, according to Wikipedia, you'll find that I, I often quote Wikipedia. Again, you um, one's got to be very careful because Wikipedia is made up of contributors around the world from all sorts of different backgrounds. 
and um, not, they're not always necessarily uh, reliable. Uh, but I have found in many cases uh, the articles in Wikipedia to be fairly reliable. The word Bible is from the Anglo-Latin Biblia, traced from the same word through medieval Latin and late Latin as used in the phrase Biblia Sacra. And some of you may have heard that uh, term, it, the terminology, it's called holy, or it's a word that, is, that means holy book. Um, in the Latin of the Middle Ages, the neuter plural for Biblia gradually became or came to be regarded as a feminine singular noun, Biblia, um, and this stemmed from the term in Greek, which is ta biblia, ta hagia, which means the holy books. Uh, if you can read any Greek, then that's what you will find. And that again comes from, is derived from the word biblion, and the word biblion means paper or book or scroll, uh, and over time it simply developed into the word book or so. So essentially the word Bible means book, but it has also then developed further so that the word Bible itself uh, really means, in, in our reference, it means the Word of God or this book that we refer to as the Word of God. Some of the beliefs about the Bible, uh, we, we're not here to even argue about it, but you are welcome to do so. Uh, again, these are some of the subjective th things that I personally believe, and I'm, I know most of you share uh, with me. The it is the Word of God. This is how God speaks to us. It is the only truth and the written word, and it leads us to the living word, Jesus Christ. Ultimately, the Bible is about Jesus Christ. Uh, if you have any thoughts uh, or questions around how this whole picture fits together, I do want to encourage you to come to the final module as well, where we actually try and put that whole picture together to find out where, where is this one message that we find uh, in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We believe the Bible is God's self-revelation. This is what God has revealed about Himself. God has not spoken all of those words audibly. He has used authors, human people like you and I, to write it down. But we believe ultimately that God revealed Himself and what He wanted us to know about Himself. We believe it's the inspired Word of God. And it's, it's, there's no doubt in my mind that it is the instrument used by the Holy Spirit to bring people to God and to Himself. Um, and that, that the, the Holy Spirit uses the Word and the words of the Bible to reveal God to us so that we can know salvation and so that ultimately we can know God. The Bible is, is a fresh book. Uh, it makes it special. The Bible is a special book because it remains fresh. You can read it again and again without ever getting bored. And, and I guarantee you that if you really take the challenge. Now, I need to tell you that I'm a, uh, if, if ever I read anything um, non-Bible or non-Bible related or non-theological, it is John Grisham, apart from the newspapers and a few other things, then John Grisham is one of my favorite uh, authors. Um, and there are many reasons for that. But I have just about read all of his books. I think there the are a couple of books uh, in the last two years that I have not read. Um, and I made a mistake just two or three years ago. I, I actually bought a book and I thought I haven't read it. And as I started the first pages, um, the story came back to me. I knew I've read it. And I actually put the book down because I wasn't going to read the book again. Now, that's the comparison between a John Grisham and the Bible. I told you before that I grew up in a Christian environment. Uh, my parents um, kind of forced us to read the Bible, almost, uh, but then it became conviction for me. So eventually I started reading the Bible, and I've done it many different ways. A few years ago, our church challenged the congregation to read through the Bible in one year. I've never done that before, and so I've actually taken the challenge and read through the Bible in one year. And then the next year I decided to slow down and, and to start slowly but reading through the Bible uh, and read in different places, but ultimately over a two, two and a half year period, I read through the Bible again. What I'm really saying to you is not only in past, but over the last three years, three and a half years or so, I have read through the Bible twice. And I know I have because I underline and I color it and so on. So I've, I know I've done that. And I cannot tell you how much new information I get every single time and how it speaks to me all the time. And so the Bible remains fresh, and I really believe it, 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 it points to the fact that the Bible is a very special book. It was written by inspired and God-fearing authors over a period of 1,500 years, give and take a few years. You could say 1,400 years or so. But that makes the Bible unique. 
Many of the other religions will tell you, so-and-so, our leader or our founder, uh, had all of this by revelation in a couple of months or in one, on one occasion found golden tablets somewhere, and this is now our holy book. Um, the reality is the Bible has been written over so many years by so many different authors, and yet when you read through it, there is a pattern, there is a golden thread that runs through the Bible, and that, I believe, makes it special. It has inspired readers throughout many different centuries. Uh, before Christ, Jews were inspired by the Word of God. Psalm 119 is a very good example of that. Um, I have just literally finished uh, Psalm 119 uh, this morning. Psalm 119 is called an acrostic psalm. Uh, it follows the, alphabet, the, the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 sections Every section in, in typical poetic style is written the exact same length. And every section includes the references, as I said to you before, to the statutes and the words and the laws uh, and the, uh, the, the precepts of God, etc., etc. But that particular author, whoever it was, was inspired by the Word of God and, and felt it necessary to go and write this long, long poem. Um, about the Bible. And, and I have done this every single day. I took one of those sections and I read it and meditated on it and said, Lord, speak to me and help me to understand. And it's amazing what has come out of my reading over the last, uh, I guess, about 22 days. Probably a little bit longer because one or two days uh, I have skipped. It continues to speak to people of different cultures, different age groups, uh, different levels of maturity, different literary uh, abilities, uh, different scholars, uh, and those who are not scholarly at all. And the Bible continues to speak to people over time. And that makes the Bible extremely relevant and special. And it has survived literally thousands of years of transition as it's been transmitted from one generation to the next and, and now we have the Bible and translated in many, many different languages around the world. Um, and over time, it has not had a, an easy ride because there were attempts, and as, as I will point out in a moment, uh, to actually destroy the Bible, to, to make it redundant, and, and to get these Christians or, or Jews even to get them out of the world and to get their scriptures um, away from them. But it has not succeeded. Those attempts have not, not succeeded. Going back into the history of the Bible very briefly, when we look at the Jews and where the scriptures come, back, come from when we look at that background, the Jews only accept what we refer to as the Old Testament. So you, you um, encounter any Jew today and um, they do not accept the New Testament as word of God. But they do accept what we call the Old Testament. They accept that as their scriptures, as their word of God. Uh, they have had oral and written scriptures from the earliest days, uh, as early as probably somewhere between 1500 or 1300 B.C. Moses, we know, wrote some of the scriptures down. Um, and uh, more, more books were added, or scrolls, or um, letters, or descriptions of history, and prophetic books, and those things have been added over time. And over a period of time uh, of about 1,500 years, these Jews collected what became the scriptures, the Old Testament. So by the time that Jesus was born, uh, in fact, about 100 to 200 years before Christ came, the collection of 39 books that we know as 39 books, they have, they have fewer books because they combine some of the books, like First and Samuel is only one book in, in their scriptures, First and Second Kings, etc., etc., uh, so they have fewer number books, but the exact same contents that we have in our Old Testament. And the Jews started believing that this is the revelation of God. This is God's book. And, and Psalm 119, uh, once again I have to refer to that, is just a testimony to that. And then the Jews today, uh, if you go to Israel or you speak to any Jew um, in any country for that matter, and they're a committed Jew, they only accept the Old Testament and they refer to it as the Tanakh. And the word Tanakh is an acronym that comes from Torah, which means law. And for, for them it refers to the first five books, or the Pentateuch, more about that later on. Uh, that's the law, Torah. And the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, uh, it's a Hebrew word that means prophets, so that's where the N uh, comes from. And then Ketuvim is the writings. And so when you look at the, the uh, uh, Pentateuch, the first five books, 
you look at the prophets, that's all of the history books. They regard the history books as prophetic books, as well as the prophetic books that we have at the end of our Old Testament. And then the writings are the Psalms and the Proverbs and a few other books around that uh, section uh, of the Old Testament. And um, together they call it the Tanakh. So when you talk to a Jew today, they will refer to their scriptures as the Tanakh. But when it comes to Christianity... Um, the early Christians only had the Jewish scripture. So they only had what we refer to as the Old Testament. So when Paul and others wrote in the New Testament, they probably refer to the scriptures as the Old Testament because that is what they grew up with, or many of them when they were Jews. And that's the only scriptures or the only Bible, if you wish, that they had uh, to believe in. But some Christian documents started doing the rounds, such as the letters. Paul started writing to the Corinthian church, to the Ephesian church, or the Philippian church. Uh, pretty soon people started realizing that they needed to write down the story of Jesus, lest they start losing it, because some of the apostles who were the first witnesses, the live witnesses with Jesus, they started dying, uh, and they realized that this needs to be written down. And by that time there probably already existed some collections of of uh, sayings or doings or actions of Jesus or miracles of Jesus. But then some of the authors like Mark and Matthew and Luke brought it all together and we refer to those as the Gospels uh, in, in our New Testament. And then of course right at the end of the first century we had John the Apostle who said that he had revelations from God uh, talking about um, how the whole picture of salvation fits together and also where it leads in terms of the future, and that's the book of Revelation. And so over time, and there were other books as well, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there are additional books that have been written that have not been taken up into our scriptures. Now, more about that next week and over the next few weeks when we talk about those additional books or those extra books uh, that we also know of. But eventually the Christian church not only accepted the Old Testament as we know it, but also then decided on the books that should be in the New Testament. And I'll tell you that story uh, in another uh, week or two. But soon there was recognition of these documents uh, and books as the authentic Word of God. And so the, today when we talk about the Word of God, this is what we talk about. 39 books in the Old and 27 books uh, in the New Testament. The history of the Bible um, in terms of the church, although the Bible existed in separate documents, um, circulated, uh, typically the picture in my mind is one of um, Paul wrote a letter, wonderful letter to the church at Rome. Uh, by the way, Paul never visited Rome before he wrote to them. He visited afterwards as a prisoner eventually. But Paul wrote to the church at Rome. And, and, and obviously someone listened to this book as it's been read to the congregation, and they said, we want a copy of that. We need to take it back to our church, maybe in Philippi or wherever. And so those were copied by hand. And so eventually many, many, many copies were available floating around the early church and around uh, the known world at the time. These were also translated. At even an early stage, they were translated into other languages. Coptic, Egyptian Coptic, for example, Syriac, um, uh, in, in the Syrian languages, and, and several others uh, as well. By 382, um, a man by the name, uh, a scholar by the name of Jerome, was asked to translate the Bible into Latin, which has become at that stage the official language of the church. Uh, from Rome, uh, Latin, the language that was used, and that eventually became known as the Latin Vulgate, uh, and, and more about that in some of the other lectures as we go through uh, some of the others. And then other translations of the Bible were made, but the Vulgate dominated the church history for probably the best part of a thousand years after it became very official. By 500 AD, according to uh, this particular website, greatsite.com, the Bible had been translated into over 500 languages just one century later. By 600 AD, it has been restricted to only one language, the Latin Vulgate. And then, it, as I said to you before, it dominated the world for the next, the Christian world, for the next thousand years. And the only organized and recognized church at that time in history was the Catholic Church of Rome. And they would not allow people to actually translate the Bible into other languages. That changed, especially with the Reformation, uh, the Protestant Reformation. 
But before that time, there were many others who attempted translations of the Bible, both from uh, the Latin into whatever language, uh, German or whatever. Martin Luther, by the way, translated the Bible in German, um, and, and he was threatened with his life because he dared uh, to do that, to, to translate the, the Bible. But thanks to the Protestant Reformation, there, was, uh, there, there came a new emphasis on translating, translating the Bible into other languages and making it available to the person in the pew. And today, we are the beneficiaries of that because we have the Bible. We actually have the choice. Uh, I, will, I will constantly use the NIV, the New International uh, Translation or version of the Bible, um, and more about translations later on. Um, but there are plenty of translations in English and in any other language, every other language in South Africa and around the world as well. This is an ongoing work. Um, even from our church here at Rosebank Union, we have missionaries working in Australia, in the northern part, in, in the Torres Strait, translating the Bible in one of the local languages uh, there. And today the, the Bible is available uh, in, in hundreds of translations around the world and is accessible to people anywhere and everywhere. What is the purpose of the Bible? I believe the Bible is not written and given to us to give us a scientific handbook. The Bible tells us that God created the world. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how it was done. It doesn't tell us how many stars there are. It doesn't tell us how many universes are out there. Uh, and when you listen to those talks, wonderful discoveries have been made about how big the universe is, how many um, multi-million billions of stars are there, etc., etc. The Bible doesn't talk about that necessarily because it's not the purpose of the Bible. The Bible's purpose is to tell us that God created the universe. The, the purpose of the Bible is to tell us that God loves us and that He reaches out to His own creation, including me, a sinner. And the purpose of the Bible is to bring me back to God and therefore Jesus gave His life on the cross for that. And so it's not a mathematical book. Um, there are many so-called errors that people can possibly point out uh, in the Bible. Um, but there are many things that, the Bible, that, that, have, that have been proved where the Bible is actually correct and so on. But the purpose of the Bible is for God to reveal himself to us and so that we can know his salvation. Paul puts the purpose of the Bible quite well uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And in verse 16, he says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That is the purpose of the Bible. And we'll, we'll talk more about this particular verse. It's a key verse when we try to understand how God has inspired uh, the Word of God. The Bible has proved itself over many years. It was accepted by both Jewish and Christian theologians and scholars. It was protected and used by the church now for 2,000 years or more. It is divinely transmitted, uh, especially, um, it, it's a very interesting study when you look at the first 1,500 years of Christianity because the Bible was copied by hand. And more about that when we talk about the transmission of the Bible. Since the, fa the, the uh, discovery of the printing press, it became a lot more easy, or it became a lot easier uh, to reproduce the Bible uh, and, and to know about the reliability of the actual prints. And then it withstood many attempts to destroy it. And uh, that's where we're going to take a break for now. Um, and we're going to have some tea. And when we come back, we'll talk about the reliability of the Bible. We're looking at uh, the reliability of the Bible. Why do we believe that the Bible is true? There are many questions that come to mind that, that I, I have grappled with over time. I'm sure many of you have, or your friends have, and they, they're wondering, why do we say that the Bible is true? And who says the Bible is actually correct? Now, we're going to answer some of these questions over time, and I cannot answer all of those tonight. But who says that God's Word is inspired? And what about other ancient books? How does the Bible compare with other ancient books that are available? And how about other religious books that are there? Um, other religions who have their own version of holy books or scriptures and so on. How does the Bible compare to that? And why do we believe in the Bible? Uh, and also, what is so unique about the Bible? 
So just a, a few little comments about that. I have already said to you, I'm going to look at that uh, in two different ways. The one is by looking at objective facts. There are certain things about the Bible that nobody can dispute. Even the atheist or the person who says the Bible is rubbish. There are certain things that you cannot argue with because they are just pure factual. And I'm going to just list those for you uh, very briefly. And then there are certain things that are subjective beliefs. And I have to admit, this is what I believe. I can't force you to believe it. I can't even maybe uh, convince you that you should believe in that. But those are things that I personally believe um, about that. And so just very briefly, when we look at some of the objective facts, I want you to just consider the following facts about the Bible. The first is that the Bible is old, and the Bible is actually very old. I have already sort of alluded to that, and more of this will transpire as we talk more ab about different topics in this module. But Moses, somewhere between 1500 and 1300 BC, that particular date is disputed. Uh, it, it, there, there are two possible dates, either it's in the 1500s or it's in the 1200s, or 1450 or about 1250. More about that in another couple of weeks when we look at the history of Israel. But let's say we take um, the, the youngest uh, of those dates, about 1300 BC. Moses already started writing down certain <laughs> documents. Um, he received the law from God, the Ten Commandments and many others. Um, he, and, and ultimately, with whatever Moses received, wrote down and collected, over time became known as the Pentateuch. may have taken a few hundred years to get to that particular point, but it is as old as that. And during the history of Israel, as we saw before, all the way up to about 100 years before Christ came, B.C., um, we have the collection expanded. And so that collection is already available by the time that Jesus walked the earth. We're talking 2,000 years ago. We have a collection that, is, that we today call the Old Testament. The Christian documents were added to that. And by the end of the first century AD, those books have been written another 200 years or so on. By about 300, uh, by the middle of the fourth century, uh, the Bible as we know it today uh, was collected, uh, was known, and was believed by the Christian church and, and, and obviously the Old Testament by Jews. So we're not talking about something that was published or written just recently. And, and as we're also not talking about a subjective thing. This can be proved historically uh, when you look at the documents and the history behind all of that. Then secondly, the Bible is unique. Now, of course, someone will immediately say, well, you say the Bible is unique. I, I don't. Well, actually, let me prove to you that the Bible is unique. The Bible documents were written by many authors and tested over time. Although there were many authors over a 1,500-year period, as we saw before, it, is essenti it essentially has the same message. It talks about the God of the universe who revealed himself ultimately through Jesus Christ and who will bring the universe together under one head, Jesus Christ. In that way, it is unique. Gary Burge said, the Bible has real significance. When I say the Bible is true, I am saying it explains life in a way that is beyond question. The Bible says something profound about human experience. And in that sense, the Bible is unique. It is different from just about every other religion. It tells us that human beings cannot save themselves, which is something that most other religions try to do. It tells us that we cannot do it, but that God himself has come down into this world to make it possible for us to be saved. Thirdly, the Bible is well preserved. Again, this is a scientific fact. Um, we, we're not even arguing about it. I can give you all the proof and you can read up uh, for yourself and do your research. The process of transmission, which we will look at in a few weeks' time, over many years before the discovery of the printing press, has been tested via scientific means. It is a study that is called textual criticism. It is used for any ancient book um, around the world, doesn't matter where it is. And the same methodology has been used on the Bible to try and prove as much as possible that what we have is as close as we will ever get to the original documents. And that process has been well tested over time. In fact, I am so confident of that that I will literally take the Bible, give it to an atheist scientist and say, you do the study, here is all the evidence, you can do the research, and you will come to the exact same conclusion that I am, uh, I'm, I'm coming to. 
the end result uh, of taking all of the documents and, and more about that in the future, uh, comparing them to find the best reading shows remarkable agreement. And I will, I will talk more about that as well. But scholars today have access to thousands of manuscripts that have been discovered over a long period of time, both in the Hebrew um, and then also in the Greek. Old Testament was written in the language Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. How does it compare with other ancient uh, documents? When, we, when I say to you the Bible has been tested and we have all of this research and evidence through textual criticism, well, just listen to these facts. Pliny lived and worked from 61 to 113 AD. In other words, roughly the same time that some of the New Testament books were written. The oldest copy that we have of Pliny today dates from 850, that is seven centuries later. And only seven ancient copies are in existence today that we can go back. And, and the oldest of that is, dates from 850. Plato wrote from 420 to 350 BC. So we're now really talking Old Testament era. The oldest copy dates from 900 AD, our era. That's a thousand years, 1200 years or so ago, maybe 1100 years ago. And there are only, again, seven ancient copies that survived. And then Aristotle wrote from 384 to 322 BC, again, Old Testament era. The oldest copy dates from 1100 AD, our era, 900 years ago. And there are about 37 ancient copies available. Now, compare that with the Old and the New Testament. When it comes to the Old Testament, it was written approximately 1300 to 400 BC. That's the time span when those books were written. The oldest manuscripts date back to the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1947 and a few years around that, that time in the 1940s and early 50s, but they date back to at least 100 BC. In other words, they are older than Jesus when Jesus walked the earth. And we have hundreds and hundreds of copies available. Most of them date from about 900 uh, to 1000 AD, I mean, to be frank and to be open about that, and we'll look at that history a bit later on. When it comes to the New Testament, the picture is even uh, more revealing. The New Testament was written about 40, probably the first, or maybe by 50, the first document saw the light, and by 95, the book of Revelation was written. The oldest piece of manuscript dates back to 125 AD, which contains a couple of verses on the front and the back of the Gospel of John. And, and again, we'll look at that, and I'll show you some pictures of that later on. Um, but the New Testament, the whole complete New Testament, dates at least to about 200 years in terms of the actual copies that we have available. Uh, they were written in the first century, but the actual copies we have date from about 200. Now, just look at the time difference. Um, in the first century, by the third century, the whole of the New Testament, and we have copies dating back to that. So the, the difference in time span from, uh, let's say, Pliny, uh, also the first century, but the oldest document is about 850 uh, AD. And then I can tell you that we have roughly 7,000 different documents. They're, they're different translations, different documents that were discovered over many years, and scholars have access to them. They're, they're kept in museums. They are published on the Internet and everywhere. People have taken photographs. They can study them in detail. And through a process, um, they are able to make the comparison between all of those hundreds and thousands of copies to come to what we believe to be as accurate as we can uh, possibly get in the New Testament. So that, that's how the Bible compares with other ancient documents. But also the Bible survived the odds. Again, it's, a, it's just a, a historical fact. Nobody can argue. The Bible was, withstood many attempts to destroy it. One such example dates from 303 AD when the Roman Emperor Diocletian tried to destroy the Christian church by destroying their scriptures and it became illegal for anybody to have a Bible. And so he tried to destroy it and obviously today we can look back and say he did not succeed and there were many other such attempts uh, to do it. The Bible is also an open book. There is no argument on the part of, of Christians or Jews to say someone uh, wrote this down in secret, received it by revelation and kept it somewhere in a, in a cave and, and, and then brought it out into the daylight. In fact, we're quite open about the process. We say that about 40 people wrote the Bible over 
thousands of years or a thousand and a half years or fourteen or fifteen hundred years. Again, the same Gary Burge said, here's something about the Bible that I think holds water with non-Christians. The Bible was not put together in secret. It is a very public process. People have been able to closely examine its claims all along, even to this day. And Christians welcome that kind of scrutiny because we know our Bible can stand up to it. There's no doubt in my mind. The Bible is accurate. Archaeological discoveries over the last few hundred years proved many of the names, the places, the events mentioned in the Bible that previously were thought to be uh, just a, a figment of the imagination or someone made this up. Typically the Hittites. The Hittite empire was only mentioned in the Bible only a few hundred years ago. And, and, and many critical scholars said, uh, where, where, where are the Hittites? Uh, the Hittites are non-existent. Yeah, the Bible made them up as a story. A few hundred years ago, actually, archaeologists discovered the Hittite empire. Proved. And now, non-biblical scholars or non-Christian scholars believe. I mean, they all talk, you can, you can go and do the search on the internet about the Hittite empire. It's now known fact. And so, again, it's just one more, it's one of plenty of such uh, examples. There are many things in the Bible that we still don't know and we still can't prove. There are many places mentioned in the Bible, cities or towns, that we still don't have any proof for or where they have been located. But bear in mind, we're talking about a 3,000 year old history. The Bible is not without its problems, uh, but it does not affect the actual essential message uh, of the Bible. And then, as I said before, it's not a scientific or mathematical or even a historical textbook. It's a book pointing us to God. In the process, scientific uh, knowledge is sometimes mentioned, or scientific um, uh, issues are, are raised, or historical events are mentioned, but the purpose ultimately is for God to reveal Himself. And then just look at this fact. The Bible is popular. Again, I, I'm not saying that because I'm a Christian. And I will say that because I'm a Christian, because I do believe that the Bible is popular, it's popular with me. But the Bible is the best-selling book ever in the whole of history. And here's the proof. Wikipedia, uh, and there are several other websites that, that you can go and search, and they will come up with the same or similar information. Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities sold 200 million copies. The Quran sold 800 million copies. That's the, the scriptures for the Muslim or the Islam faith. Mayo's uh, communist little book, a little red book, sold between 800 and 900 million. The Bible has sold to date between 2.5 and 6 billion copies. Now, just these are just facts um, that you can, you can go and search for yourself. It's been translated into multiple languages, and it's available around the world, as we saw before. And the Bible has a wide appeal. I'm all, again, I'm not saying that because I want the Bible to have a wide appeal. It is just a fact. The Bible has a wide appeal. It has been used across cultural and time barriers. Um, it has been found to be relevant to people in need of God everywhere and anywhere. From Palestine, where the Jews lived, uh, that whole area all the way to Asia Minor to Europe. It dominated Europe for many years. It provided Europe with a, 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 a sort of a Christian uh, worldview. Uh, it, it, is, it, it spread across to America. Right now it is in South America. Uh, it, has, it is busy impacting the East like you cannot believe it. It is in Africa. The Christian church is spreading in Africa. These are facts. In other words, people around the world can embrace the message of the Bible and find it to be relevant and true for themselves. It penetrates different worldviews. There are people in every country who believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, it has been translated uh, by now in approximately two and a half thousand um, languages and uh, there, are, there are almost 7,000 languages, known languages in the world. Many of them are spoken by small little pockets of people uh, but the process is continuing to try and translate it into different languages. In fact, it's something that is encouraged. There are certain religions where they discourage that. In fact, they don't allow their scriptures to be translated. We encourage that because we believe it is something that everybody needs to read. And then very briefly, I want to share with you, and this comes from my heart. This is my belief. This is what I believe about the Bible. This is why I call it my subjective or personal beliefs and comments about the Bible and its message. I believe the Bible is powerful. 
I, I will use the argument with a non-Christian or with an atheist, but, but I'm not necessarily able to convince that person of the truth of this. But I have experienced it. I know that many people have. There are many, many testimonies of strange sort of things in inverted commas that happened uh, because people picked up a Bible somewhere or they were in need or they in a hotel somewhere alone and uh, they picked up a Gideon's Bible or whatever and it just hit them in the face and something happened and the Lord used that to change their lives. There are many such testimonies of people who have been changed and I believe the Holy Spirit uses the Bible to convict people of their sin and their need of God's forgiveness and to live in a relationship with Him. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 uh, has an interesting reference and it says about the Word of God, it says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. I can't tell you how many times I've picked up the Bible, read it, and have been convicted of something that I know is either wrong or something I need to do or something I've neglected to do, and the Lord used the Bible to speak to me. The Bible is powerful. The Bible is inspired by God. We're going to have a whole lecture just on that, uh, but just very briefly. Uh, the Bible as a book has many writers, but one author. The Bible is both human. We, we, we're not even denying that. No, nobody says, no Christian says that God spoke it all, wrote it all down, and gave it to us in, in the form that we have. it. Nobody is saying that. We're saying that human people wrote it all down. We believe that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to do so. And therefore, the Bible ultimately is the inspired Word of God. And this is the Bible's own testimony. We've read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. We'll give more attention to that in another lecture. But the Bible proclaims salvation. It gives assurance of salvation. And that is that anyone and everyone who knows God through Jesus is saved. It affirms and it confirms our future destination with God. Uh, and therefore, based on the Bible, I have no doubt where I'm going uh, when I leave this life. It describes life in such a way that we can see the big picture of God's involvement in this world and is preparing Christians to share eternity with Him in the new heavens and the new earth. That's the message of the Bible, and that's where, where we are heading. And the Bible has a personal impact. I shared this with you, so let me just be, be very brief. The message of the Bible gives hope to people who live life without hope and no clear idea of their true destiny. And when you find people like that and you can start sharing the Scriptures, the Word of God, the Bible even says that the Word of God will never return to Him empty. And so sharing the Word with people, I have seen the changes that it, it brought about in their lives. It brings peace. It brings calm to people when they face the biggest possible tragedies. Uh, I, as, as a pastor, I have sat many times with people who were bereaved. Uh, and, and just sitting with them, I have, I have no words. Uh, they're the cliché such as, you know, things will turn out better, or this must be God's will for you, all those kind of things. And, and I've, I've started avoiding those clichés. I don't even want to mention them. Because I, I don't know how, how I identify with people who have just lost a loved one through death. But, but more often than not, and this is something I've learned, I have said to people, I want to take the Bible and I, I want to read something. I read Psalm 23, for example, or some, some other known or unknown passage with them. And, and I have been amazed over time to see the calmness that comes. I've, be, I've done many funerals. And uh, uh, to me, it's quite interesting to watch this phenomenon because you will have people coming in and they cry. And sometimes the coffin is there and they will cry and cry. And they, then they see a family member they haven't seen for ages. And then there's more crying. And um, then uh, we sing a song like Amazing Grace. There's even more crying because of the tone of the song and everything else. I open the Bible, I start preaching, and it's amazing the calmness that comes on that congregation. I have seen it again and again and again in a funeral, where the Word of God speaking hope into uh, that situation. The Bible is always fresh. I've said this before. So one can read it over and over and not get bored. There is always more to discover in the pages of the Bible, and I encourage you to read it because you will, you will find more guidance there. And it guides us in different situations and facing different challenges. Um, many people face different kinds of challenges. The Bible is not specific in every single area. The, the Bible never told me, go and marry Joan. The word Joan does not appear in the Bible. And so if you're going to look for that, you, you, will, you will be disappointed. 
because the Bible doesn't tell you, go and study at Stellenbosch University or, or something like that. Uh, but the Bible may provide you with guidance in making a wise decision when you need to make a wise decision. There are certain things that the Bible provides, the guidelines, where I don't even have to wonder about that. If a Christian comes to me and says, I've got a, a non-Christian girlfriend, I want to marry her, or a boyfriend, I want to marry him, I don't have to worry. I don't have to quote the verse. I can tell them the Bible says, don't be in, in the same yoke as an unbeliever. You, you're looking for trouble if you go that route. I can go on and on and use many different kinds of examples. That's the kind of guidance that the Bible will provide you with. The Bible is down to earth. The message is straightforward, simple, for anyone to understand. I believe you can put it in the hand of a child who can read. Um, an illiterate person can listen to a tape or to a sermon or a message or the, the Bible being read and understand the message because the message is fairly simple and clear. But it provides guidance for life's decisions, guidelines to follow, as I just said. But the Bible and God can handle our doubts. And uh, this to me is mo probably one of the most uh, encouraging and comforting thoughts about the Bible is that I can... I can even see Bible authors sometimes grappling with issues of life, especially when you go through the Psalms. You go to the book of Job. Uh, these people are grappling with issues of life, like I'm grappling with those issues. But it gives me the encouragement and the courage to grapple with those same things and to talk to God about those things and to go back to the Bible. As long as you don't turn your back on the Bible or your back on, on God, uh, you can have your doubts. Now, Bible contents. This is the last section of our lecture tonight, and then we'll be finished. What do we find in the Bible? As I said before, there are many writers, but one author uh, in the Bible. Go to your Bible index if you have a Bible here. I'm, I'm not sure that you have brought a Bible. And by the way, this particular module, I'm not necessarily going to do Bible reading. I, I will have my devotion at the start of a lecture but my purpose in this first module is to provide, provide back, background information, context, history, uh, and so on. So we're not necessarily going to do a lot of Bible reading in this one. In the second and third and the fourth modules, we'll refer a lot more uh, to the Bible. But if you open up your Bible at the index, um, in my NIV, it's called Contents. It's listed under the books of the Old Testament. There are 39 of them. They don't have numbers, but they have the page numbers, starting with Genesis, ending with Malachi, and then the books of the New Testament, um, and uh, starting with Matthew, ending with Revelation. Some 40 authors, as I said before, contributed over a period of more than 1,500 years to put this product together that I'm holding in my hands. This is the final product uh, we call the Bible, and there is that golden thread that runs through the Bible. And, and we believe it's because God was behind all of this. Now, the story doesn't start in Genesis and end with Revelation. In a certain sense, it does, because it starts with creation and Jesus' second coming. So in that sense, it does. But if you're going to look for a story and you start with Genesis and read it like you read a novel starting with day one and it all ends with day or uh, here 1,000 or whatever, you, you're going to be disappointed because the Bible sort of jumps around a little bit of that is historical information. Others is more worship kind of information. Uh, the prophetic literature, you need to draw back into the historical section once again because those prophets lived during the history of Israel. Uh, and they're not always easy to understand, especially if you don't know their background. So that's part of the purpose of this course is to help us understand um, some of that background. And when you look at it, there are two testaments, as I just said, and one book. The word testament refers to a covenant or an agreement. Today we would probably call it a contract. Um, the, the two people or two companies or parties enter into a contract. It's an agreement. In biblical terms, in the ancient world, it was called a covenant. So two people, and there were all sorts of ways of doing that, of, of uh, establishing a covenant between two people. And we have some biblical examples of that based on some of the ancient uh, ways and practices of that time. But it refers to two people or two parties entering into an agreement with one another. So from a New Testament perspective, we talk about the old agreement, the old covenant, the Old Testament. This is the way God entered into uh, an agreement with humanity using Israel as his nation. In a New Testament, we say, well, Jesus said, 
that he came to fulfill all God's promises and to fulfill the old covenant. And therefore, even in the communion service, we say, or Jesus said, this is a new covenant with you. And so Christians then became used to referring to the new covenant, the new agreement. It doesn't mean it's two different agreements. And that's one of the major things that I am going to try and point out to you. We do not have two different books that have been welded together in one by some dude somewhere in the past. This is the one and single message of the Bible. It's the one single God who revealed himself over time. Another concept that I'm going to explain to you much later in one of the other modules in more depth, but we call it progressive revelation. And that is when you read Abraham, um, or about Abraham, and you read about David and what they have known about God, they, ha they have been limited in their total knowledge of God. It is only when you get to the New Testament that you see the whole revelation of God coming together and sort of, it's like a puzzle then beginning to fit together. Hence the title of that last module, The Big Picture. Because the big picture is actually talking about how the picture ultimately comes together. So the Old Testament is the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh as we saw, uh, or scriptures, and it tells us the story of God's revelation to Israel before Jesus came. The New Testament describes Jesus' as coming, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and then the establishing and establishment of the early church, and then it finishes uh, with Revelation, which is how it all will ultimately culminate with the second coming of Jesus. So in summary, uh, when we look at that page, you have 66 books if you do the count, 39 in the old, 27, 27 in the new, two testaments, one single message. When it comes to the Old Testament, um, again, I encourage you to look at, um, at your, your page there and, and the names, and we'll look at that in a moment. But the Old Testament provides the background to the New Testament. Uh, and I will be using abbreviations, by the way, OT for Old Testament and NT for New Testament, more often than not, just to save some space. And it points forward to the revelation, but it's the same revelation. It's the same God. Ephesians, Paul tells us that we have been selected or elected predestined by God before the foundation of the world. That is, before God created the world, God already had a plan. That plan came to culmination and fulfillment when Jesus came to this world. So the Old Testament is no accident. It, is a, it looks like a little bit of a deviation. It looks like a bit of a bypass, but it's actually preparing the world, something I will, I'm going to try and point out to you, especially when we look at the history of Israel and the intertestamental period. It's the preparation for what God wanted to do uh, in the New Testament. But the New Testament is where it all culminates in the coming of Jesus Christ, uh, the Messiah. So the Old Testament needs to be studied for what it reveals about that long-term plan of God. As the beginning of God's story, it tells us how God worked in Israel in order to prepare the world for Jesus the Messiah. And in addition to the great lessons and the guidelines that we learn from a Christian perspective, it also provides us the foundation of God's overall plan for the world and for the future. The word genre is, a, I think, is a French word that really means a literature type. Uh, the types of literature. Now, the Bible is a big book. And it contains many different kinds of book, uh, books, and it has not been written by one single author. <clears throat> and therefore, we talk about these different kinds of genres. Uh, when you study in school, it's a long, long time since I've studied any language, official language or university, they will then take you into different genres. Sometimes it's poetic style, prose, or uh, uh, what, whatever kind of literature that you will study. We find the same thing in the Bible, different kinds of genre. Now, the main sections or genres that we find in the Bible include the Pentateuch. It's a genre on its own. There's a bit of history, there's a bit of law, in fact quite a bit of law. Um, there's also um, the, the, the movement of Israel or the establishing of Israel through Abraham. It tells us the story of, of Egypt and the Exodus and the establishing of the nation in the desert and then it stops right before uh, the people go into the land of Canaan. And it, it makes a, a, a genre on its own, because it's not exactly history, although it's their history in it. It's mo mostly law, and the Jews therefore refer to it as law, and we talk about the books Genesis to Deuteronomy, when you look at the index in your Bible. 
Then we have, according to our division, the Christian division, the Jews call this uh, the early prophets. But we call them the historical books. And it really starts with, with Joshua. And Joshua tells us the story of the entrance into the land of Canaan. Then judges how they settled. Then Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, telling us how the kings were appointed and, 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 and how they reigned for many years. And then how Israel, both Israel and the northern and the southern kingdoms came to an end. And then it tells us how um, Ezra, Nehemiah, how people came back from the exile. And so all the way to Esther and a couple of stories related to that. And we call that the historical section of the Old Testament. Then we have the wisdom literature. And it starts with Job uh, and it ends with uh, songs and lamentations, which is part uh, just after Jeremiah, needs to be classified as part of that. These are wisdom books. They're poetic. Uh, when, you, when you open the Psalms, they have been written in our NIV or translated and, and, and published in that particular way. And, and many of the books there are actually published in poetic style with lines like we do poems and that sort of thing. We call them wisdom literature. Wisdom because uh, in Proverbs, typically you have a lot of human or, or uh, uh, yeah, human wisdom being shared with one another, common wisdom shared with one another. And then we have the prophetic literature in the Old Testament, starting with the book Isaiah, uh, all the way down to Malachi. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about those divisions as time, go on, time goes on. But when we get to the historical section, uh, when we go from Joshua, especially when we get to the kings, by, when, by the time the kings were appointed, the prophets started operating as an official uh, position in Israel, if you wish. And... Uh, when you read the book, uh, chron when you read the Bible, the Old Testament chronologically, you're confused because you get to the end of Nehemiah, and by that time people were in exile. Then you get to Isaiah, and you wonder where does he fit in? Well, the prophetic books, most of them tell us where they fit in. You need to kick them back into the historical section because they fit under the kings and they operated under the kings. And when we do the second module, we look in detail at how the prophets. Um, operated and how they ministered and when they ministered and what their messages uh, are. More genres can be found within those books. As I said before, in the Pentateuch you find historical books. You also find in the historical books some psalms and poems, which is wisdom literature. Uh, a couple of the psalms are written in such a way that they refer to the history of Israel, but they're primarily wisdom literature. In Isaiah you find stories about the kings and so you do in, in Jeremiah, because Jeremiah lived when the Jerusalem fell, and he tells the story of the fall of Jerusalem uh, to us. So you find the, the genres actually mixed up in the Bible, but these are the, the, the general big sections that you find in the Old Testament. Now, when we go to the New Testament, they were written in the last half of the first century, uh, as we said before, uh, A.D., uh, these books were collected, acknowledged, and finalized over a few centuries, a couple of hundred years, and by the year 300 or so, they were definitely finalized, and we have the 27 that we now have in our New Testament. Um, for most Christians, it, the New Testament reserved, uh, received more attention than, than the Old. Um, in some sense, I believe it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pity, because the Old Testament provides us with, with a rich knowledge about God and who He is and, and how He operates, and especially how we prepared the world for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's logical for us to latch onto the new because that's, that tells us about Jesus and he, how he died and, and how he, he saved us and, and how we should be living as Christians. So it's very natural for us to, to sort of tend to go to the New Testament more than the Old. But it tells us the new about Jesus' coming to this world, his message, his deeds, as well as the beliefs that, that the early church um, formulated and wrote to one another, Paul and John and J Jude and others who wrote and told us the, the story of, of Jesus, but also how the Christian church uh, should be behaving. Now, when we look at the New Testament, we also, again, have four major or main genres. The first is called the Gospels. Now, the Gospels are historical um, in look and feel, but they are not just the story of Jesus. It doesn't necessarily tell us logically and chronologically everything that Jesus did. In fact, John, the Gospel of John, tells us precisely that. He says, um, I don't think the books in the world would contain uh, the story of Jesus if I were telling you everything. But I made a selection so that you can know that Jesus is the Messiah. 
That's essentially what he is saying. And so the Gospels are narrative proclamation. Narrative meaning story, and proclamation being the, the preaching of the Word. It's the story of Jesus, and there are two main types of Gospels. Even at a cursory reading, you will find that Matthew, Mark, and Luke look the same, feel the same. They contain the same story. In fact, sometimes they are verbatim the same. Not John. John does not repeat anything that they repeat or tell it in the same way. He has a very different kind of feel to it when you read it. Far more, um, uh, it is a proclamation uh, and it is also a confession and, and pointing people to the fact that Jesus is uh, the coming Messiah. So those are the two kinds of Gospels. The book of Acts is history. Again, with an emphasis on proclamation, however, it tells the story of the start of the early church, starting with the, res the, um, the ascension of Jesus and then ending with Paul in prison in Rome when the gospel has been preached in the known world at that particular time. And then we have the epistles. It's a word that we use for uh, the letters that different people wrote, most of them from Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, but we also have Peter, John, Jude, James, um, there's the letter of Hebrews, um, and so on. Uh, these were written by other authors, and those are letters that people wrote to one another, or uh, a leader wrote to a particular church or individual. Paul wrote 13 of them, and then there are general letters. They are general uh, because of a variety of authors, and not all of them have a specific audience or a recipient mentioned. So we call them general letters. And then we have what has become known as apocalyptic material. And apocalyptic, um, you will recognize the name of apocalypse from some of the movies and so on. Uh, it, it really talks about some kind of disastrous event, uh, which is a major event that brings things to culmination sort of thing. And there are many such examples, a uh, couple of them in the Bible, and then many outside of the Bible we have. But Revelation is a, is a good example of Christian apocalyptic uh, type material. And we only have that one, and that is the book of Revelation. Now, that brings us to the end of the lecture tonight with uh, a really a, a good introduction and overview. And from next week on, we'll, we'll look at more detail um, at some of the other things. But I, I want to encourage you as, you as you go home to go over your notes again um, and to do that every week just to reinforce what you have learned and to make sure you understand everything. And if you have any questions, feel free uh, to uh, make them known. And to do some further and additional reading to enhance your knowledge, uh, you can look at the books uh, that I referred to here tonight and, and also on the internet or whatever other resource you want to use. Start memorizing the names of the books of the Bible. And I'm going to divide the 66 books into seven weeks. So over the next seven weeks, I'm going to encourage you to memorize the books of the Bible. Uh, so that next time someone says, when you read from Zephaniah, you don't think it's a swear word, but it's actually one of the prophets in the Bible. Or Haggai, or whatever. Um, it's not someone shouting. Uh, it is a book in the Bible. So I really, I'm going to encourage you to do that. So at the start of every lecture, I'm going to say to you, take out a piece of paper or on the back of your notes or wherever, just write down uh, about 11. We'll divide them up in 11. So next week, I'm going to give you an opportunity to write down uh, the books, just the names of the books from Genesis to 2 Samuel. Genesis to 2 Samuel. Memorize them. Genesis, and try and get into some kind of a rhythm as far as that is concerned. Genesis, Exodus, and so on. And then commit to regularly reading the Bible. Um, I, I would be very happy to give you a reading plan. Um, I've mentioned a year reading plan. There are plenty of them. They're available on the internet, by the way, everywhere. Um, or divide it up into chunks that you can handle. Don't try and tackle too much. If you've never read the Bible, don't do five chapters a day, especially when you hit Leviticus, you're going to stop, because Leviticus is not an exciting book, and, and uh, there are other more exciting things to do. And there are different ways. One way is to read from Genesis to Revelation. Another way is to read a bit of Genesis, a bit of Matthew um, every day, um, or maybe Genesis, Psalms, and Matthew. So you divide it into three chunks, and you start reading systematically in different places. So there are many different reading plans. If you need one, I can certainly help you uh, with that. The important thing is that you actually read it. And then next week, I'm going to take a look at the Bible canon. Uh, the question is, how did these 66 books get into the Bible? 
Why only 66? Because there, there's more. And then what about other books that were left out? Wh which are they? And where are they? And what do they teach us? And then um, I'll see you next week. God bless you.